Hello everybody, I'm Jacques, and this is the first video in my series on painting a Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game miniatures. In this episode, we'll be preparing them for painting by washing them and priming them. I'll go over the why of both those steps when we have a little more free time later. For the purposes of this series, I'll be trying to keep all of the footage as unedited as possible so you can follow along with every step and every mistake and hopefully learn something from it as we go along. The first thing we'll be doing is going over our materials that we need for this little project of ours. Of course, the first and foremost material in that set is the miniatures. For this one, we'll be doing four of the A Song of Ice and Fire tabletop miniatures from the Kickstarter campaign that went on a few years ago. I'm not sure how long. We'll be doing one of the miniatures in each of the main colors, plus an extra just because he's got a horse, and who doesn't like horses? So that first one we saw, obviously a neutral one in brown. I think it's Brienne of Tarth. Then we have some Lannister guardsmen here. We've got, I'm not going to try and pronounce her name, but it's the Mormont lady. Uh, she's got a nice fur coat that I really wanted to play with, uh, and that I think will work well with our ink painting technique. And finally here we've got Sir Brendan Tully, the Blackfish, which some of you might recall from either the TV show or the books. Uh, he's mounted on a horse, and I thought that would be interesting. The other things you'll need are two bowls, one and two, and a toothbrush. Just use whatever scrap toothbrush the dentist gave you last time as they were kicking you out the door and tell you to floss more often. There's only one more item we need after that, to if you count the water, and that is cheap dish soap. That's not actually the kind of dish soap I'm using here, apparently. My wife informed me later that she's been filling it from an even more no-name brand. So, use whatever you've got. Finally, this isn't essential to the whole process, but if you're messy like I am, you'll probably want some sort of paper or non-paper towel to mop up your messes and dry the miniatures off at the end. Once you've got all your stuff assembled, grab the two bowls and go off and get yourself some warm water. While I'm off camera filling those bowls up with warm water, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're washing our miniatures. It might seem a little weird because who cares, you know, they might just be a little dusty or something. That's not actually what we're trying to wash off. A lot of companies, in order to help the molds release the miniatures without damage and provide fairly crisp sculpts, use some form of mold release. That mold release compound will normally be washed off long before the miniatures show up at your door, but just to be sure, we want to wash them thoroughly with some dish soap and some water like we're about to do here in order to make sure there's nothing stopping the paint from sticking to the miniature. After all, after you've put in a whole bunch of work making that miniature look beautiful, the last thing you want is to chip it on the edge of a desk even after you've managed to varnish it just because the paint didn't actually bind to the surface. With these new sort of miniatures they make nowadays, they can get particularly smooth surfaces on them, which is really nice for metal surfaces, but it also means that paint may have a hard time getting a grip. So I've just dipped my fingers in the water to test them the old-fashioned way, and I'm firing in just a little bit of dish soap. Um, you're going to want to do this by feel, just enough to make it bubble up a little bit, um, but not enough that you know the water is fully frothy. Stir it in with your toothbrush and test the consistency, and if you're cool like me, also spill a whole bunch on your desk. Like I said, we're going to go unedited. I'm going to show you all my mistakes, even if they're little goofy ones like this. I'm going to grab those paper towels. I'm going to mop it up a little bit, try and get all the miniatures out of it as best I can. My desk, obviously, is well-worn and well-used, so I'm not too worried about that. It's just a matter of, you know, being clean in your workspace. So carrying on, stirring a little bit, I'm going to make sure the mixture is right up where I want it to be. At this point, I'm taking a look at the bristles of my brush, checking for any little bubbles, and I'm not seeing any bubbles in the corner of the bowl. So I've decided it's not quite soapy enough. I'm going to stir in just a little bit more. It's not rocket surgery, but, you know, this is an important step in the production of a miniature, so I made sure to show it here. Once I finish stirring it in, pick up my brush, take a look. There's some bubbles gathering in the little corners of the bowl, so I'm going to grab a miniature, and here I go. I'm just going to start brushing some suds all over them. Now again, this isn't crazy difficult, but there are a few things you want to keep in mind while you're washing your miniature. The first is, especially with these little miniatures that they can make nowadays with uh, many details and so on out of plastic, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of parts that are not attached to the model itself. Uh, for example, on that Lannister Guardsman, his sword in front of him is loose. Um, and on uh, Miss Mormont here, there's her scabbard sticking out, her mace sticking out, stuff that with traditional molding and casting techniques on metal miniatures might not have flown, but on our new technology we're able to make do with. While you're brushing, make sure you don't bend or break any of that. The warm water is going to make it all a little more supple than you might be expecting, and all the sticking out bits are probably going to catch a little bit on the bristles of your brush. So just be cautious, have a slightly light hand. I'm not saying you got to be Pablo Picasso and a perfect artist here, I'm just saying, you know, be cautious. And of course, if you drop it, take a second to contemplate your life choices, 
and get back at it. It's soapy water anyway. No harm, no foul. Just make sure nothing's busted. Now while I have a minute here again, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I picked these miniatures. These miniatures are pretty standard with regards to the quality we're getting nowadays from Kickstarter games and board games even. And so I figured that would be a pretty good place to start with the kind of miniatures that a lot of people are going to be unboxing for the first time, looking at and thinking, wow, I think this would look great with paint on it. Hopefully this tutorial series of sorts is going to help new people get into the hobby of painting up their miniatures because by showing all of the footage I am, some parts are going to be a little long and boring, but you should be able to follow every brush stroke every action, and simple stuff like charging your paintbrush, uh, stuff that I could never find a video on when I was starting out. Hopefully you can see me do it in these videos and that'll help you a little bit. The other thing is I think these miniatures are actually a little more challenging than, for example, some classic metals that you might be painting. The same ease of casting these small details that I talked about earlier in terms of things to make sure you're not breaking means that these miniatures have a lot of undercuts and overhangs and things that would not have been manageable if we were taking a clay sculpt and casting it into pewter back in the olden times. Just as an aside, here I am, I'm just firing them in with the uh, fresh water now and rinsing them off. Again, not rocket surgery. These undercuts though are something you're going to have to watch out for as you're painting up these miniatures and that will in fact come up later on when we're priming them even. Where a traditionally sculpted miniature couldn't really have any of these undercuts for fear of it not casting properly, these miniatures, which get produced by computer and machined, and then assembled afterwards at a factory somewhere, wherever they're ordered from, have the luxury of having these sort of gaps inside them. So here I'm going to just pry a little bit. You can see how the sword is really wobbly. It's only really connected at the top at the pommel, uh, which is wonderful as far as realism and having that gap behind it that would exist in real life, on a traditional miniature you'd probably see it stuck to the chest slash the skirts. What you'll probably quickly find while trying to paint these guys though is that it'll be very difficult to get in behind it and get an even paint job the way that maybe you envisioned it. Fortunately, these parts mostly hide the parts that they're obscuring from vision as well as from your paintbrush, so you can sort of get away with it. And that's that done. The miniatures are all finished being washed. That can be one sitting after work one day. You know, we're looking at under 10 minutes. Let me just drop my camera on my desk here for a second. Everything's fine. And now we're going to grab them. And of course, as my wife points out quite rightly, you don't actually need to dry them. And in fact, you might be risking breaking small narrow pieces if you do so. But if you want to be able to paint them relatively soonish, you're going to want to just give them a short little wang jangle like this just to get some of the bigger drops of water out of them. Of course, we don't want to dry in every single nook and cranny. That's just crazy. Just, you know, give them a pat dry. Just get the surface a little dried off so that they'll air dry a little smoother. Or, as my wife said, just set them down on your desk and come back to them in a day or two. Depends on your climate, depends on the time of year. That'll probably be plenty. Here I'm just cradling them a little bit, making sure the big drops that gather in capes between legs and chainmail, that kind of stuff, for all coming out and getting soaked into the paper towel, make sure not to squeeze too hard and keeping my fingers real sensitive for the tips of swords like that one, or for any other parts that one could bend or break. Remember, they're still going to be a little warm from having been in the warm water, so check all your extremities, make sure nothing's getting bent out of shape. Once you're done with them all, you can just take them out, set them aside, make sure you line them up nice and pretty so they look super aesthetic when you close up your painting desk for the night. And just clear off the desk, pick up all your other stuff, your soap and your napkins and all that business. Come back to it later. That's going to be sort of a recurring theme here. We're going to be doing everything in sittings. Fairly short sitting. Not everyone, of course, has the kind of free time it takes to do an entire miniature, including drying, in one sitting. Whether you've got a job or school or whatever, I'm hoping you can kind of adapt my workflow to your schedule and make it something practical for you. All that being said, it's time for day two. So first off, there's my air compressor for my Badger Patriot airbrush. I don't know what kind of brand it is. I got it from Michael's, an art store in Canada. Uh, they have coupons all the time, including big old 50% off coupons. So I strongly recommend if you live in Canada, give it a shot. It's not every day you can get an air compressor for half off. Of course, I do have to say, you don't need to use an airbrush for priming, but I do strongly recommend it if you have access to one at all, even a cheap one of some sort, one from a hobby club, get a hold of it. I'm just going to throw my air compressor on the ground now because it takes up a whole lot of desk space. Plus, the guy tends to walk once he starts vibrating. 
Here's my airbrush. It's a Badger Patriot. Again, pretty cheap. Got it with coupons at Michael's. The next thing we've got is um, sticky tack. That's Elmer's glue sticky tack. We're using it because these little plastic models, they're going to go flying as soon as you start blowing an airbrush at them. So I'm going to put a little bit on the bottom. I'm going to stick them down. For my primer, I use a Vallejo Gray primer. It's a pretty good primer, but it's also one of the reasons I recommend using an airbrush. Its consistency when applied with a paintbrush is not fantastic. You're going to find that it might be a little too thick. It might be bubbly. When it goes on perfectly, it's really an exceptional base coat for what I tend to do, but you'll want to keep that in mind. If you are trying to apply it with brushes, use bullet points like this. You can use the tips to sort of flex into gaps, pull out pooled varnish, or even, because they're pointed, to pop bubbles that might appear. In the past, I've had some success doing that. In this case, I won't be doing it because I have an airbrush on hand, uh, so I'll be airbrushing. That being said, when Vallejo goes on well, it goes on very well. It is an exceptional varnish, in my opinion. You'll get a very soft surface across the entire surface of the miniature, and you'll never have any issues with your paint or inks having traction. Here I am just demonstrating the process of popping bubbles out of the cape. Yes, in case you hadn't guessed, this voiceover is done in post. All of the miniatures we have here have pretty exceptional surface detail, so getting your primer on thin enough that you can be working with the detail the sculptor gave you, rather than just painting over top of it, is going to be key here, whether you're doing it by brush or by airbrush. If you are doing it by hand brush, don't be fooled, don't thin your primer. Thinning a primer can really ruin its consistency, and it can mean that it is less effective as a primer. With Vallejo in particular, you may find that it gets chunky or rubbery when you add a uh, thinner to it. So just don't try that at all. Use it as it is, or find a different primer that works better for you. The screen here I have so that I don't ruin everything on my desk every time I spray paint. And that little box just elevates them so that I can spray on it a little better. It's just maple syrup from Costco, because yes, I am from Canada. And I put some masking tape on top to give the Elmer's tack a little more traction. I also have a respirator, because I don't want to die in my 30s of my lungs having become primed. Strongly recommend this if you are going to use an airbrush. As to the elevation point, you may be wondering why do I need to elevate them? Is it purely for my own comfort? Well, sort of. I have a gravity-fed airbrush, which means that you're not going to want to be tilting it forward or back too much while you're airbrushing. Tilting it may mean that whatever liquid is in the hopper doesn't fully seal over the chamber through which the air is flowing, and so the venturi effect cannot continue to affect on your airbrush, and you'll find you have a really uneven flow. So now I'll just pull out the caps from my airbrush and get it ready for painting. In case any of you were wondering, this is what it looks like when it's ready to operate. Hold it roughly like that, brush forward. When I said I was going to show you every possible aspect of the workflow, I did mean it. I want this to be as accessible as possible for people who've never painted a miniature. Now I'm going to start affixing my miniatures to the stand. Doing so can be more or less difficult. With these guys, it's actually not that bad. As you can see when I held them up upside down, they've got little pegs on the bottom of their bases that I can affix the Elmer's tack to. Some miniatures, in fact many, have fully hollow bases, which means you have to get a little bit creative and either use a really big pebble of Elmer's tack in the center, or put it along the edges and hope that it sticks. I really can't overemphasize the utility of finding some way to tack down your miniatures, because the first time I tried painting or priming, I don't remember which, some plastic miniatures with my airbrush, they just flew off across the room and it was, frankly, quite surprising and a little bit distressing because I was fairly worried that I would have broken something the way that they just spun off into space. Long story short, if you're not trying to open your own Kerbal Space program, tack them down. The masking tape was originally also an idea where I just wanted to use the tacky side of the tape to hold miniatures down, but learn from my mistakes, it wasn't that effective, because obviously when I'm spraying paint at that stand fairly regularly, or primer or varnish, some of that material ends up getting on the tape as well, and that just means that it stops sticking within one session, at the most. Now to beat a proverbial horse, uh, I'm just going to re-emphasize here. You've got the sword on this guy in particular, I can see being an obstacle, because as I spray my primer on, it's going to be difficult to get it in between there. It's also going to be difficult to get it into his elbows and into other locations like this, small undercuts on any of the miniatures. Whether you're priming with an airbrush or by hand, it's useful to identify these problem areas beforehand, so you can be conscious of them as you start actually laying product onto your miniature. 
With a brush, these are certainly areas I'm going to have to be worried about pooling or the primer bridging between the two parts that are so near to each other. With my airbrush, I'm probably going to find a very similar effect as far as pooling goes. With the airbrush, on the other hand, I don't have that option to use the bullet point to reach into nooks and crannies, pull out some paint afterwards, move it around, make sure there's not very much on my brush. My airbrush sprays a cone, and that cone is fairly constant. At a long distance, you can do what's called dusting, which is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be using the vaporized paint to lay on an extremely thin layer, thereby preserving that surface detail. If I bring it in closer to narrow the area I'm spraying, a whole lot more primer gets deposited in one place. So it's not very good for precise work on little miniatures like this. Now you can mask things and that sort of stuff, but I'll get into that in a later video. Suffice to say that in this case, especially when dealing with those undercuts, if I need to touch somewhere up, I need to be conscious of the fact that I'm going to be applying paint all around that area as well. Now I've just thoroughly shaken up my primer and put it into the hopper of my airbrush. This is true for anything you're going to be applying to your miniature over the course of this process. Make sure you shake it first. Almost anything we use is going to contain some pigment and a medium, and if those aren't well mixed, you're going to have a dearth of one or the other. This can give you issues with coloration, with consistency, or any number of other issues that you really don't want to have when you're working with your miniature. Before I start spraying, I spray it onto my screen. This starts the flow and gives me the chance to make sure everything's coming out evenly. It also means that any obstructions in there, whether they be bubbles or dust, will be blown out somewhere other than on the miniature, where tiny details like that will probably be noticed at one level or another. Once I've charged my airbrush that way, I'm going to walk it down, still spraying a little bit to make sure the flow continues, and then start spraying onto the miniatures. You'll see I'm keeping the airbrush fairly far back and continuously moving. This is overspraying the miniatures slightly, which is why I have a screen, but it's making sure that I'm getting only a very, very thin layer on the surface, preserving all of that detail the sculptor's given us. We don't want to waste that. In fact, taking advantage of it is the big secret to my technique for painting, and what can make it look fairly good for way less work than the guys who go to all the effort of the 17 different glazes, etc., etc., you may have seen elsewhere on YouTube. After I've primed one face, I do my best to move them without touching anywhere, especially, especially not, smooth surfaces, where my fingerprint will leave a mark on the primer. I turn the miniatures 90 degrees, and then I'll move on to apply a new layer on that side. This isn't a second coat exactly, because I don't really do multiple coats, especially not of primer. Again, I'm a firm believer in preserving what the sculptor has given us. However, you may find that there is some overlap. Try and work that to your advantage. If you're finding the edges of one face aren't fully covered, well then, turning it and applying it to the next face may actually help you with that. From this angle, we can now see some of those undercuts we've already been discussing on that Lannister Guardsman at the far right of the painting stand. The inside of his arms and the front of his chest are clearly still red, despite me having primed that side. I'm going to go back afterwards and touch that up. I'm not going to worry about it too much now, I'm going to let the first layer settle. One thing to keep in mind is that your primer will shrink a little bit. It's a sort of rubbery compound, and it's going to sink into the gaps as it dries. Don't rely fully on that, because it can't stop pooled primer from ruining the surface of the miniature. But if you're looking at it and thinking that things are looking a little muddy now that you've applied your first layer, if there's still the hint of the detail underneath, you may still be fine. This is unfortunately a little bit of a judgment game, and I kind of hate leaving it at that, because I know what it feels like to have the YouTuber, whoever you're going to for information, just telling you, Eh, you'll have to figure it out. But some things are like that in life. And in this case, you're going to have to look at it and maybe have a trial miniature beforehand that you don't care as much about, so you can see how the primer dries. This will particularly give you the opportunity to compare your primer to mine. If primer starts pooling in ways you don't want it to, if you act fast, you can still salvage that. A brush, a slightly moist brush, not wet, that doesn't have anything else on it, placed into a pool of not only primer, but also paints or inks, can draw a little bit of it away. Don't overuse this, and don't wait too long before doing it, particularly with the primer. Once the primer starts to set up, it's not going to be wicked away by the brush, you're just going to leave weird marks in it. That really won't help your clean finish. I've gone all the way around my miniatures now, and I'm just finishing up the last face. What I'll be doing next is I'll be just looking them over. 
once again, I'm rotating them and taking a look at areas that I know I was watching for. There you go, I'm indicating. I had already found these undercuts. I knew they were going to be an issue. If you look at the miniature now, it's got a very distinct pink look to it. That's not really going to work for us coloring it later. We can have a little bit showing through. In fact, I expect a little bit to show through, but that's too much. So I'm going to really modulate the amount of paint coming out by using my index finger to move the needle back and forth inside the airbrush and try and extremely lightly redust the front of the miniatures. Try and get all those undercuts, get them covered without applying too much paint. This is a real balancing act. I could have opted to do it by brush, but in this case, I decided that especially on the Lannister Guardsman, again, our problem child, most of the areas that had been hidden by undercuts were chain mail or other surface details that were really, I couldn't afford to lose them to a bad brush stroke or an overcharged brush. As such, I'm going ahead with just a very, very light airbrushing. I'm gonna do this to all of them, searching them over. Brienne was actually something of a pleasure because aside from under her skirts, she was pretty much covered all over already. But I'm gonna go over all of them. I'm gonna look for any undercuts that I may have missed. I'm gonna try not to touch them more than I have to. And I'm just gonna finalize the process of priming. Remember that primer is what's going to help all of your future steps to stick to your miniature. If you don't prime thoroughly, there are going to be areas that are not going to stick down as well, or they're not going to stick down the same amount at the very least. And this will give you some issues later down the line. Priming honestly can seem like one of the most boring steps in this whole process. It's all one color, it's really flat, it's really monotonous, and it can be a little meticulous. That being said, don't cut corners on it. You wouldn't build a house without a good foundation, and you really shouldn't paint a miniature without a good primer, and, in my opinion, a good wash beforehand as well. These are just steps that will save you heartbreak down the line when you bring your guys over to your friend's house, you knock one over on the side of the table, and the paint on the elbow chips off, or the knees. It's a terrible feeling, and there's really no good way to salvage that without repainting your miniature. That being said, there's always hope. Stripping a miniature is not as hard as it seems, and I'll definitely be doing an episode on that in the future, because the knowledge that I could strip my miniatures and start from scratch if I didn't like how something turned out is one of the biggest things that's helped me move forward with my painting and just put paint to miniatures more often. People will tell you that practice is the key to everything, and I hope you're not tired of hearing it because I'm about to say it here as well. Practice is the key to making miniatures. Unfortunately, practice is also the process of making crappy miniatures, and I know that held me back for a while. Don't let it hold you back. I'll tell you now for sure, and I'll make an episode to prove it later, stripping a miniature down is easier than you think. So just paint. Just practice a little bit. Try something new. Try something weird, even if you don't think it'll work out. Maybe it will, and if it doesn't, you'll try that miniature again later. You haven't ruined it forever. Plus, as with any artistic pursuit, if you decide you don't like something you did, don't put it down and just give up on it the day of. Come back to it a day later or a week later. Often you'll find it sort of changes how things look to you for some reason. Maybe you don't notice the thing as much because you don't remember it as much, or maybe you just got used to it. But one way or another, you may find you like things a lot more than you think you did originally. All right, with all that being said, it's time now to clean up after ourselves. I'm gonna take my airbrush, and I'm going to bring it to the bathroom and just put in a little bit of water, a little bit of dish soap into the hopper. I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to fire that stuff through just to clean off the needle. For acrylic products, this is often more than enough I've found. I know airbrushes will recommend that you use their actual thinners and their airbrush cleaner to clean them off, and I'm not saying don't do that. In fact, you probably should with some regularity. But for regular everyday use, just the dish soap and the water again. We can stick to cheap stuff because... We don't all have enough money to be buying thinner every day just to be able to airbrush some miniatures. That being said, the cleanup is essential. Don't skimp on that. When you spent all your money on buying nice airbrushes, nice paint brushes, don't go, eh, I'm too cheap to buy a block of soap for my brush. I bought some brush soap on sale at my local art store again a long time ago when I was just picking up oil painting. And that stuff has lasted me till now and looks like it'll last me through Armageddon. That being said, it has done wonders for my paintbrushes. It's kept those bullet points pointy, and it's kept all my other brushes pointing in the direction they should be. Before that, I was super frustrated because my paintbrushes kept getting all frayed up after one or two uses, and I had no idea what to do about it. 
find some brush soap. I personally am not enough of an expert to tell you whether it's just bar soap or if there's any alternative for it, but if there is, maybe give it a Google, see what's up. I personally went to the art store, got the thing that they recommended for artists, and it worked wonders. And I recommend that to you as well. If you have an art store that offers coupons or has sales at some point, just pick it up. Here I'm firing my soapy water through the airbrush, and I'm working the needle back and forth. You can see me just jerking it in and out. That mm, Edit that in post. Um, but anyway, I'm playing with the needle, and I'm making sure that the entirety of it is getting some soapy water on it, and it's spraying through. The combination of that soapy water loosening up the acrylic materials and the pressure spraying it out the other end is what's going to make sure that your needle continues to be movable for the foreseeable future and continues to be useful, obviously. Imperfections on your needle will mean that your cone of paint is going to get more and more irregular. There's going to be drips coming out the bottom. There's going to be all sorts of awful stuff. Frankly, when I first got my airbrush, I didn't take that good care of it. I got a little bit of stuff on the needle and it was immediately noticeable. It was also easily immediately corrigible, even without taking the airbrush apart. That being said, I recommend you learn how to take your airbrush apart to clean it every once in a while, and remember all the parts for it. I lost a piece for one of my airbrushes, and didn't find it for quite some time, and all of a sudden I thought my airbrush was broken. So, of course, not to be patronizing, but learn your tools. I didn't do it at first, most of you probably won't do it at first, but if somebody at least listens to me right now and at least knows all the parts of their airbrush before they take it apart, I guess I've accomplished something today. And that's about all I've got. Now I'm just rinsing out my airbrush. When I finish, I'm going to turn off my air compressor, disconnect it, put on the caps, and set it aside to dry. After that, tear down the whole painting desk, set those primed guys inside it, and we'll be good to go. I'm going to put up some glory shots here of the miniatures after they've been primed. Uh, it didn't turn out great quality. I'll work on my setup for the future, but hey, at least something. All that being said, thank you very much for watching this far. I hope it's been useful to you. Today we've covered washing your miniatures and priming them in preparation for painting. Next time, we'll go through a few sessions of putting ink on miniatures. In the meantime, play some games for me.